Welcome to the Love of the Star podcast. I am Bobby Bell, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105 Through the Fan of Dallas. Joined as always by former Super Bowl winning NFL scout Brian Broaddus. He is now the co-host of the G-Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105 Through the Fan in Dallas. He is also the co-host of the Dallas Cowboys pre- and post-game radio show on the Dallas Cowboys radio network. And Brian, you're back home. I'm back home. I, I love being out there in Oxnard, but I was uh, I was ready to be back in normal sleeping hours. I'll say what I think Friday and Saturday night combined, I got more sleep than I got the entire last week we were in Oxnard. So I, I feel much, much more rested now. Well, nobody's going to feel sorry for us, Bobby, because of how nice that trip was. But I do miss being across from you uh, in a hotel room doing this show. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers are happy that we're able to tape this and they're able to see our faces as we do this. Yes. So that's, that's a very positive sign. And, uh, and you mentioned the Cowboys pre and post game show. This will be the first time in like six, seven years, I believe where I'll be on Cowboys pre and post game show. I usually have done the radio, uh, with Brad Sham for preseason football, but they've got some things going on with TV. Babe Laughlinberg is back doing radio with Brad. So myself, Zach Wolchuk, Eric Chiafalo, we'll have you some uh, Cowboys pre- and post-game show thoughts uh, coming up this, uh, this week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. How about that? On 105.3 The Fan. And, and, all, your and Dallas, all your Dallas Cowboys network people as well. That exactly it. Now, uh, did I get that right? Did I say that? You, right? you did Dallas Cowboys Radio Network. I think you got it. Now, now yeah. give you. They're giving you the uh, the Dak Prescott treatment. They're saying probably not getting the 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 preseason reps you normally get. I, I do want to start off with that before we talk about some of the training camp stuff. Mike McCarthy did say he doesn't anticipate Dak Prescott taking any training camp reps or, or preseason game reps. I get that to a point uh, typically as if you've got another team coming in and you're practicing against another team during training camp, I always think that that's good work and, and you don't necessarily need to go and get in the, uh, the live game reps that may not be necessary, but you are putting in a new offense. You didn't practice with another team this year. Couldn't a series or two benefit Dak Prescott, just go get some live game reps out there before it's just showtime against the giants. Well, do I have Zach Martin playing right guard? Because I kind of see why they didn't work against any other opponents. The Cowboys defense held – I'll tell you this, Bobby. There were days where the offense was struggling, and then there were days the offense was good, and it was back and forth. And I knew it would be like this if McCarthy scheduled the practice to where they had competitive periods and stuff like that, and I think they have. And so – to me, the one thing that, you know, I I just worry about in a preseason game, you know, are you going to want in a first game, you know, one or two series, you're going to start Tyron Smith, you're going to start, you know, who, who, who is my offensive line? Who are my receivers? Who are my tight ends? You know, am I going to go in that game? Now, if you go in there with the intention of giving Dak work, but you have all the starters in there doing the same thing, then I, I could absolutely see running a series or two. I, I tell you, one of the best series I've ever seen Dak Prescott have was his very first one he had against the Rams in 2016 when he was a rookie. You know, he had to start that game because of all the injuries and stuff like that with, with Romo and then Kellen Moore, and boy, did he look good. I mean, it, him and Des Bryant and those guys, I mean, it was, it was one of those things you're like, wow, maybe this guy is the gamer that we all thought he was. So I, I think that to me, uh, it just who all's playing with Dak if he were to go out there. And, you know, let's be honest, it wasn't really perfect out there at right guard for him. And, you know, how much do you want to, how much do you want to play Terrence Steele in that first preseason game? You know, and you get, I mean, I, I, I just, I'm just looking at I'm just looking at, you know, who all can I play in order to if I had to to make sure that Dak Prescott's uh, not compromised in any way. Let's uh, assume Zach Martin is not available week 1. Uh he's still holding mm. out. Um you know which it's it's already costing him a pretty I believe he's up to 600,000 that he owes yeah. right now. How are you feeling about that? How are you feeling about that whole thing because I kind of felt like that Zach Martin didn't want to get fined $50,000 a day 
you know, and, and there, there comes a point in time where, you know, man, the Cowboys just, I know you're running into the same people I am at camp, man, yep. they're, they're dug in. They're really dug in on this one. And I, 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 I felt like there would be some type of compromise. Maybe there still will be a compromise, but man, the more I talked to people out there, the more it was like, no, we've, you know, there's things we got to do. And, you know, and, and we'll go from that. I mean, at one time he was the highest paid interior offensive lineman in the league. And, you know, that happens through time. You, you, you start to lose that. I mean, there were some massive contract extensions that just took his number and just drove it down the board, you know, with Brandon Sheriff was one of those and Quentin. Chris Nelson, Lindstrom. Chris, yeah, Chris Lindstrom in Atlanta. There were a lot of them that, that just drove his number way down the board. Yeah, and, and man, I I clearly was, and I said it at the time, I was prepared to be wrong about it, but, you know, I did feel like after talking to some folks, like, hey, this is something that everybody anticipates, they'll figure it out. They're going to figure it out, they'll get it done, and I think it just, it and, and my anticipation was we'd have a deal done before we left uh, on, on Friday the 4th, and that didn't happen. Um, this is something where it, it does I feel. Didn't realize, I didn't realize how dug in he was. You know, or how I, much they were. They, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't realize how much either side was as dug in as they were. And, you know, it does get to a point where do you think there reaches a point where if they have to if he has to pay back bonuses, if he holds oh. up that he pays back bonuses, the question of the money he, that he has to pay back if he retires is now out. That's the yeah. money he has to pay back at that point. Now, are we looking at potentially a threat of retirement? Do you think? Yeah, I mean. So if yeah. The way you just described it, if he retires, he has money he has to pay back, right? That's, that's Which will the, have already been paid back if he holds out to a certain point. Yeah. I was reading, a, Joel Corey did a really good story on CBS Sports. And I think it's, I think it was dated, I think it's August 4th, if you go back and check. And Joel kind of walks you through all the things the August possibility, 4th. yeah, all the possibilities that that can happen uh, for him. You know uh, what the Cowboys can do, how they can make this work. He he gives you solutions, but he paints a really dark picture for Martin when it comes to their ability to go after his salary. You know, to go after what prorated signing bonuses and stuff yep. like that. So yeah. Which is, which is the amount that they could go after in the event of retirement as well. And sure. so if he does end up having to pay that back, at that point, it's like, well, look, I've already lost this money. It's already had to be paid back. So right now I, I can either threaten retirement. I can ask for a I'll tell you this. I, I do feel confident that there have at least been other teams out there that have called and said, I know you're not trading Zach Martin right now, but if things go sideways, just remember we're over here if you want to pick up the phone. Like, I do think that there have been some teams that have said, hey, uh, put us in line. We, we'd like to be in line if you guys end out needing to make some phone calls. Yeah, I, I know one of my gang is seven. I asked, I asked, what do you think you could get for Zach Martin in trade? And never got an answer back. So I wonder if my gang of seven is one of those teams that, you know, that was making a call, you know, about that. Yeah. And, you know, so – I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if the Cowboys want to get to that point. Um, th I think the fact that Zach is working with Duke, I see that as a positive. Duke Mannyweather. Mannyweather. I, I see that as a, 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 yeah, Duke. I make it sound like Duke University. I'm sorry. <laughs> Duke, Duke's just a friend and I call him Duke. But yeah. uh, the fact that he, that Zach's working with him tells me that he still wants to play. You know, I, I don't think you go through this and keep yourself ready if you're not your intent's not to play. I'm going to be honest with you, Bobby. I have never come to the point where I felt like that there Zach Martin was going to be traded. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I I I never that that thought never ever ever crossed my mind. But as you and I'm not trying to be irresponsible here, but the Cowboys have to look at their situation. And Zach is obviously looking at his situation as well. 
it's clearly a different look without him in the lineup. And I, I think I think Matt Farniak has done some good things, but it is clearly a different offensive line without Zach Martin playing next to Terrence Steele. You could see Do- it. You could see it when they when they run plays uh, and, and in, in pass protection as well. Do we feel like if if this team doesn't work things out with Zach Martin in time, do we feel like the opening day lineup, if you're to go from left tackle all the way over to right tackle, that the lineup is Tyron Smith, Tyler Smith, Tyler Biotish, Matt Farniak, and then right tackle is Terrence Steele? Do you feel yeah. comfortable that would be the combo? I think that's I think that's exactly the route that they would go. Now the issues then turn into what happens to it. Let's since I, I'm using the word now. Let's be honest. You know we went into camp. I know I went into camp thinking about running back questions, linebacker questions. Uh, the questions I had about. Other positions, uh, maybe not so much. I think I would put offensive line now at the top of my list of things that I saw with my own eyes that I have concerns about, and that's the offensive line, and that's the and that's the actual depth. If something were to happen to any one of those offensive linemen, I don't know. I don't think Josh Ball is ready. Uh, Matt Willetsko has been okay uh awesome richards is a guy that's been getting some work and you know probably not ready i just don't know they might have to they might have to go get a veteran offensive lineman is what the, because i don't think a, a doga i don't think a doga is the answer any a doga a doga has been getting beat really consistent any in any in any, good. In any in any operation tackle or guard Tackler guard, I just don't see that. And now, I would say offensive line, it, and even when Zach Martin comes back, I would consider, I would consider going out and getting somebody else, because I, I just don't feel like, I don't feel like that they have guys that are ready, if they had to go into into the season with the backup guys that they have right now, As if something were to happen. Yeah, no. Am I wrong? Yeah. Did you, no, I, I absolutely you... agree with that. I, I think that, I think offensive line. We were uh, on Sean and RJ on Friday morning. We were talking about where do we feel most comfortable, things like that. And I said that yeah, my biggest concern right now. If you're going to tell me a position group where I feel the most concerned, it's the offensive line because I know yeah. this pass rush is good, but man, they are. There has not been a single practice where the offensive line held them back the entire day. There were days where. They were good for the majority of practice, but then by the end of it, I think the sac- second padded practice was that way. Offensive line was good for the first maybe half of it, and then by the end, it was just consistently breaking it down, breaking through, and it's everybody pretty much. I, I mean, I think Tyler Smith has had a good camp. I, I haven't noticed a, a lot of issues with Tyler Smith. Terrence Steele is working his way back in a little bit. Tyron has has been hit or miss at times, but uh, I mean, I think right now, I feel like if you were to say – there's one position, the position of the most concern for you right now. Wouldn't you say it's offensive line, probably? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I just so I don't, I don't know. Like I, like I was saying, and I'm sorry I repeat myself a lot. No, no, you're I, good. I really try and not do that, but I do. That linebacker group, I was scared about the depth. I was scared about the running back depth, and but it's it's totally flipped for me. It's totally flipped. It's I don't know. I don't know another position. I think every other position they could handle some type of of an injury or a little setback yeah. or something. Uh, maybe even tight end. You know, maybe even tight end. Uh, you know, could be a, a position that you know could be fine. I, I mean, but this offensive line. I'm not trying to scare folks out there, but if you've seen clips, and it's just not Micah Parsons rushing. It's, you know, I mean, and that, but that just shows you that Dallas has a really good defensive line. They have a good front seven, and they put a lot of pressure on Dak Prescott in the pocket uh, to make good throws. I mean, they can't hit him, but they're constantly around him. And it was to the point where Mike McCarthy had to remind guys, hey, 
stay off the quarterback, stay off the quarterback, you know. So, uh, man, it, it, it's – I thought there was going to be surplus, potential surplus with some of these guys. No. I, I mean, and we'll see. We'll see how the preseason games roll. But I know Dallas Cowboys backups against their defensive line, against their own defensive line, was, was, was not a pretty sight. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, uh, speaking to that discussion of how the defensive line has looked and how the pass rush has looked, I, I want to highlight one guy specifically, and maybe a troubling sign for the offensive line. Maybe it's an encouraging one for the uh, for the defensive line. What have you thought about specifically Jonathan Hankins and the way he's looked at it. I, I think he's flashed some pass rush ability in these practices that I haven't seen a ton of throughout his career. And again, that, that may be a concerning note for what the, the offensive line is doing, but man, when I've been out here at these practices and, and we can highlight just a couple of guys that have stood out to us and made us feel good on either side of the ball is, Hey, this person's stepping up. Jonathan Hankins is one for me that I look at and I say, wow, that's uh that's that's a guy that that I'm I'm really impressed with. And Dan Quinn, when we talked to him on 105 through the fan, had said that Jonathan Hankins, that was one of two guys he highlighted along with Donovan Wilson as the guys that when somebody new comes in, he says, follow that guy's lead, follow the way that guy works, follow that guy's toughness and his intensity. That's the guy that you need to model yourself after. And so a high praise from Dan Quinn in that department. And then he's also showing up in these practices. Yeah, and that's, you know, we were just kind of thinking he and Mozzie Smith, and it was really encouraging to see the Saturday practice. Speaking of Mozzie Smith and the one-on-one, he was able to get off the ball better. There was some times where Mozzie just was a tick slow. You know, you watch him, the power, the stuff, all that's fine. But he's just got to come off the ball quicker. And, you know, yesterday you saw a little bit better of that. So that was encouraging that way. But – you mentioned Hankins. Really, uh, you could also throw Quentin Bohanna in there, too. Yeah. You know, there, there's been a fire that has been lit under Quentin Bohanna with the addition of Mozzie Smith, with Hankins re-signing. All of a sudden, Quentin Bohanna, you're looking at him and you're going, well, wait a minute now. We're going to keep three nose tackles on this roster? Eh, probably not. Probably not. So, uh, it's good to see – all of those noses or one techniques getting opportunity, but also having some success. Yeah. And uh, some other guys along the defensive line guy that I, I haven't been super impressed with. That was a bubble guy, uh, Neville Gallimore to this point. I, I don't know how much he's had good practice. There've been a couple times I've seen him end up on the ground. Yeah. Look concerning there is Neville Gallimore. You think right now on the outside looking in. I would say of the guys that we mentioned, he would be the fourth guy. And that's kind of just – I've just noticed – I've noticed Quentin Bohanna the most. I mean, Hankins – Hankins has been fine. But I just really do feel like there's something there with – like like the light came on for Bohanna that, okay, I can't – I can't be getting blocked. I can't be getting scooped or reached or not getting any kind of push or hold up blocks while, you know, let my guys run free. But, yeah, the, the you're, you're right. There's been some couple of times where I think Gallimore has, has been off balance and it's, it's you know, it, that's a concerning thing. I could say, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to sit there, you know, once you get the all-22 – like when they play these preseason games, you could go through and study and see how they're playing. But you're just from the eye of watching practice, you know, you're trying to kind of follow some things. You're like, okay, where's the ball going? Oh, wait, hey, okay, there was a big hole there. Oh, wait, you know, Gallimore got knocked to the side or Bohanna, you know, but, or, but when they're making plays, you could also see it. You could also see it in the nine on seven drills when they're getting up the field and getting in the backfield. Oh, so Diggy Zawa does that. Uh, Golston does that. You know, so you're starting, you know, when you could tell on nine on seven when it's just straight run, the guys are winning blocks and getting off. And that's, I think I've seen Quentin Bohanna do that quite a bit. Let's talk about some of these other battles that we've seen at this point. Guys, we think that could be uh, on the outside looking at guys who are winning that right now. We talked about this is going to be a big camp for two of your uh, corners that you drafted a couple of years ago, Nashawn Wright and Kelvin Joseph. Uh, what's your evaluation been of both so far? For me personally, I know there's been a lot of clips of Nashawn Wright getting thrown on. Mm -hmm. 
that's just Nishan Wright's been on the field opposite Stefan Gilmore a lot. And so he's the one getting targeted in high volume. I thought he's had a solid camp. He's made yeah. some plays. I think he's been decent. It's just been he's been a volume target because of who's across from him. And for me, at least, I think pretty definitively, we've had Nashawn right above Kelvin Joseph in these practices. Yeah, I think you're right about that. You know, there's been a couple of times where, you know, Kelvin Joseph has been in position and has made plays, but you mentioned it with Nashawn Wright. He's been the one guy that uh, he's had interceptions, he's had PBUs, uh, he's also given up some plays. And, you know, but, th- but he – the microscope was really on him. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, Kelvin Joseph, I think Kelvin Joseph has something to fall back on if he doesn't have success on defense. I don't know if Nashawn Wright has that, you know. And, and, that, and that was going into, that was going into uh, training camp. But, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to find ways to get Kelvin Joseph on the field. They're playing him in the slot. They're playing him as that kind of a nickel, that linebacker, safety guy. You know, they're, they're trying to find spots for him to, uh, to, you know, have some success. But you're right about Nashawn Wright. I, I, I felt like one foot in the parking lot for him, but he's done a nice job, much like what we talked about with Quentin Bohanna. All of a sudden, a light comes on. You go trade for a corner. You're starting. You got some other corners that are. You got a, uh, you know, uh, Bland, Deron Bland. He he shows up. You know, you got, uh, you know, Jordan Lewis soon to be back. You know, I mean, there's 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 not much room at the end. Uh, in the end, uh, so those guys have to find ways to make plays. And I I think if you said, well, what kind of camp? I mean, well, Na- you know, Nation Wright looks like he's every clip you watch, he's giving up something. Well, there's a lot of clips that you don't see where. He's actually making plays. So yeah, he's been he's, he's been he's been he's been a lot better than he's been in the past. Put it that way. He, he's been in a good position, I think. Now, when we look at this receiver group, uh, you know, I, I think the names we were really looking at coming into this camp were okay. How do Tolbert, Turpin, Fajoko? How do they perform? Jalen Brooks really came in and has had a fantastic camp. It seems like every year there's always the the seventh round undrafted. Lance receiver. Lenore. And somebody, there's the Lance Lenore or, you know, whoever it may be, Danny Amendola or, or whoever else throughout the years that always makes a, a splash at the receiver position. Um, and this year, it's it's definitely Jalen Brooks, who as soon as the pads came on, he just, it clicked and he became a, a star out here at these practices. Assuming Gallup, Cooks, Lamb, that's your top three. Is this team right now keeping six receivers, do you think, with... Turpin, Brooks, Tolbert, and maybe Fajoko on the outside. I think the one guy that's on the outside right now, and he's really going to need to rally is Fajoko. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I kind of, I don't, I, you know, when you mention the guy that's been shocking to me is Turpin. That's the one that has been shocking that the amount of plays that he's been able to make and, you, you've put it very well about him. He doesn't have a big catch radius and stuff, so you have to see him laying out and making plays. But, you know, by gosh, he's made plays. I, I've said this earlier. I said it on 105.3 The Fan on our show, The G-Bag Nation. This is, you know, that, that son of a gun played a lot of football last year, a whole USFL season and then a whole NFL season. You know, and, and this is the first off season that he's had in a while probably – where he can get his body healed up. He looks good running routes. The quarterbacks are confident throwing him the football. There was a there was a an interception or a dropped interception yesterday's practice that Bland had. Bland came off on coverage because Turpin had separated from Hooker. Somehow that ended up where Hooker was in coverage and was having to carry Turpin across and to Bland's credit, he read what was happening, dropped off his man, went back, and was able to make the play. But if he's not there, that's a big, big shot right there for you know from Dak to Turpin, uh, you know for a, for a play. And he's been capable of doing that. And there, if you if you you look at how like the last three guys have played, Turpin, you know, with what he's done, Brooks with what he's been able to do. You know, and and 
and then Tolbert, I'd say those three guys are going to ma- are making it very difficult to say, hey, you're not just going to keep five wide receivers. You're going to keep six. And that's that's kind of where I think it's at right now. You're trying to figure out between if you're just only allowed to keep five, you're going to figure out between Tolbert, Brooks, and then and Turpin. But they're all three having the type of camp where they're being – they're making it hard to, to let them go. Who else, as we just wrap up this segment before we get into the, the mailbag, who else during this camp has either really stood out to you and kind of caught your eye and surprised you maybe? Because, um, I mean, obviously we know Lamb and Parsons. Those two have had the best camp probably on, on both sides of the ball. Par- Lamb has been unreal. It's It's been like watching old school Des Bryant training camps, the way he's just – he'll catch everything in his vicinity. Parsons continues to wreck shop. But outside of the obvious ones, who's caught your eye in a positive way and who's maybe been a little quieter than you were wanting them to be heading into this camp? Well, in a positive light, I'd have to say Eric Scott's caught my eye. You know, they like a him a ton. Yeah, and you know, here's a guy that's played a ton of off coverage, and then you watch him when he has to play press or man. He is in position. He knocks down balls. Uh, he's around the ball. Uh, he's not the you know physically. He doesn't look like the biggest guy, but I'll tell you what, my man makes a lot of pr- plays. I didn't. I know we've talked about one Yay Thomas, uh, you know the safety. You know, here's another guy that like I didn't know a whole hell of a lot about him to be honest with you. Guys shown up, made a lot of plays. Um, if I have to say disappointments or guys that are kind of going south on me a little bit, I, I pick your offensive lineman, pick your backup offensive lineman. You know, did. Did I feel like Matt Willetsko was going to be better? Sure, I did. Yeah. I felt like he was going to be a lot better. You know, did I feel like that uh, that uh, uh, you know Adoga? Adoga, yeah. I mean, just take your pick of whoever the backup offensive lineman is. I can say I know I know Farniak is filled in, and you know he's had his moments where he hasn't been great, but. Which he's, I think, I think Farniak's been fine. It's just he's, he's been fine, but you know, he, he's not been a black hole. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he gave up a sack in mean, a practice. I was watching the pressures, and you know, I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, the guy's thrown in there. He's had what he was at center. They were running fourth down, short yards plays. They had two bad snaps. You know, where him and Dak fumbled the ball. You know, I mean, I know there's a lot going on. There's poor kids trying to play guard. And he's trying to play center. I mean, but. Take your pick on backup offensive linemen not stepping up. Maybe we'll get that in the preseason games where these guys will step up. But, man, there's been some practices where I think it's, 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 it's very glaring where some of their issues are. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, it is now time for our Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag. And uh, I know you'll you'll have a question banked up here. Uh, somebody had reached out to you. Uh, you want to go ahead and hit that one first or you want to come back to it? Yeah, our, our good buddy of uh, the program, Prince Faisal in, uh, in mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia, uh, who loves the program, follows everybody on all the platforms. Uh, one of my really, really good friends uh, overseas uh, reached out to me and says, and it goes back to the offensive line. He says, why won't they sign a backup guard? My question is for the love of the star, especially that they don't know what will happen with Martin. So it kind of goes to the things we we're talking about, Bobby, if you want to address that. Why, why don't they just go and sign? Are they going to let these guys play it out and, and see what happens? But, again, Prince Faisal, I appreciate your uh, – uh, answer the question and always hanging out with our podcast. Yeah, always, always listen, always appreciate that. Uh, so I think that a they're 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 banking on a couple of things that they want to see play out first. They want to see does it click for some of these guys, some of these young guys. Does Zach Martin return? And then if it doesn't, I think at that point, then you may be looking at we've got a surplus at receiver or we've got yeah. a surplus at corner right now. Like somebody, yeah, there you go would bank on Kelvin Joseph if we've decided Kelvin Joseph isn't working out here and we'll swap. All right. Let take, 
take your fresh start guy for our fresh start guy. We all could stand to hit the reset button. I would say that if things hold the way they are, they will go acquire another offensive lineman. Like I, I think that that would be what they do, whether it be they they scan the waiver wire, look at cut downs. It's not often that you'll usually get a cut guy for, from offensive line if there's any sort of quality at all. Um, so it may be a, a trade that needs to be made, but I do think that the Cowboys are going to have to make some sort of acquisition. And I think that they will. Brian, uh, what do you think on that? Yeah, I, I, I do too, Bobby. And it's so hard because I kind of felt like there was going to be the surplus of the offensive linemen that maybe they could go out and if they had to get the running back or they had to get another uh, linebacker that they were going to be able to do that. But, you know, real, real, I, real quick, but, but before you go too far down the line, I'm curious. Where would you say right now? What position after watching these practices do you think is the deepest that you will have a surplus? Is it corner? It's it's in the secondary. Yeah, I think so. I think I think somebody, I think somebody. If 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 these corners continue to play like they have, and they've had some good days, and they've had some days with, but they've been competitive in all the periods. I think you might also have. Uh, you know, maybe at that, that maybe at that safety spot too might be. You know, when I mentioned, uh, you I know. mean, you've got Wilson, Curse, Hooker, and then and Hooker, who by the way we didn't even mention, signed an extension this week. Yeah. They, they like him clearly. And then you've got Wanye Thomas and Israel McQuam right. who just turned to practice, so they definitely have depth. Right. Yeah, they have they have some depth of the position. I think to me, you know, my hope is that in the preseason that all those guys play well, so then then there's that potential for flipping. But this might be a team that's in that trade market for an offensive line. I mean, maybe, maybe do very similar to what they did to get, uh, you know, to get Gilmore and to get Cooks is do you go ahead and trade one of next year's picks for a, for a, legitimate, for a legitimate guard, you know, or a legitimate tackle. I think there'll be a day where Awesome Richards will be just fine. I just don't know if it's going to be right now, you know. Do you, so do I, I need, I need, I, I'm going to need something. I'm going to need something at guard, and I'm going to need something likely. And this is if the Zach, even if the Zach, to answer Prince Faisal's question, Martin comes back. I'm still adding somebody. I'm still, I'm, I'm changing out. I'm changing out players. Seven, eight, nine, potentially is what I'm doing. Now you had. Uh, the, I just want to be careful. We got to remember here. If there's one spot, the last time they they traded secondary depth. For oh, they traded Kansas City, depth. right? They traded Charvarius Ward away, who's become yeah. arguably like that. a top ten, top fifteen corner for Parker. Never Anger. forget that. Snapper. Never forget that. Yeah, he was. You fact, were a you were a big Charvarius Ward fan when they signed I loved, him. I liked I him a lot. Play. I love the player. And the thing about it was that he was, they were getting ready to play the Houston Texans. And I'll never forget to sit in the press box with Brad Sham. And I'm looked down on the field and he like was going to warm up. And the next thing you know, he's in street clothes. And I'm thinking, uh oh. And then that's when the trade went down. They basically, he was going to play and he got traded right before the game. I mean, literally yep. right before the Houston game. So. Uh, yeah, but they're they're gonna have to do something, Bob. And I believe, I, I think they're on to something. Uh, like I say, I think a lot of people are asking about that. Would you go out and add a veteran piece? I, I could say I don't think Adoga is the answer right now. I mean, he could prove me wrong, but from what I've seen at tackle and guard right now, it's not a help. Next question here from Brandon: Are you getting the feeling that Saturday's struggles at kicker won't force the team to bring in a veteran free agent? Seems like both Aubrey and Viscano will get another chance. Uh, and, and we haven't talked about the yet Saturday, the mojo moment kicking session. Uh, the kickers went one for six, uh, which is not great. Brandon Aubrey made uh, the one kick. Viscano went 0 for three during the period. I still believe, I've said it consistently, I, I refuse to believe, given what we've seen out there, that the kicker is on the roster right now. I think they, I, I don't think either one of these guys are kicking for the team week one. If it's going to be one of them, I'm going to lean, I guess, Aubrey a little. Man, I'm uh, leaning, I'm leaning Ken, the other I think, way. I think, Vis, I think Viscano's been better. Generally, what we've seen, I think Viscano's better. I think they like Aubrey more. It's a little bit like where we were at last year with Hyra Lahu and uh, Garibay, where it's like Hyra Lahu had been better, 
but it felt like they liked Garibay more. Oh, they to, wanted Garibay. They wanted and Garibay so they, to be the so guy. So I feel like I feel like we're in the same position. I think Aubrey they like more. Vizcano's been better, but they don't necessarily like either enough to say they're not going to go get somebody. It's amazing how they – it's amazing how these kickers, and trust me, myself, Todd Archer, uh, you know, we were out there, uh, you know, watching these guys and – and others and just you know you're like it's amazing how they like one of them they would have a good run where they'd make three in a row and then one guy would miss the next guy would step up and he would miss too it's like they couldn't they couldn't it's like they it's like they felt sorry for the other guy oh hey i, I really don't want to win the kicking job here i'm gonna i'm just gonna i'm gonna follow yeah up, i'm gonna follow up your miss with my own miss you know, and it just, you know, they, it was always when, the, when we were charting them and Michael Gelkin, you know, in the morning, we were all charting these guys and it's like, there were always two misses and it always were kind of like when one guy would miss, the next guy couldn't take advantage of the situation. So I, I said it earlier too. I, I don't think the kicker's on the roster currently. I just don't. Next question here from uh, TGM. It says, with Zeke, Kellen, and Schultz gone, well, Zeke's gone for now, who knows. Uh, with Zeke, Kellen, and Schultz gone, how do you think the Cowboys' goal line offense will change? I'll say this. I don't know if you know that that, that two-point two stuff was really good. It, it was. Two, and, here's, and, they're, and, they're, and they're like down in the red zone, they were good. That one day, man, the offense was humming when it was like the two-point plays, it went five for five. So Here, they here's what they I, didn't run the ball. They didn't run it. No, all. no. Here's what I'll say. I think that there's going to be. I think if you were hoping the change to McCarthy would mean more motion uh, during games, you're going to be disappointed. I think this offense is going to be more static than they were even last year. Uh, the one area where I will say I've noticed a lot of motion is on the goal line. When yeah. they're in the five, they use a lot of it. Then you, they use Turpin, Deuce Vaughn guys where, where they're trying to get a lot of motion going so the one area where i have seen it has been on the goal line so if you're looking for what's a noticeable change i think it might be man that's where we're seeing a lot of deuce vaughn Cavante turpin and and some stuff at the snap with those guys specifically when they're inside the five yeah that the, like when they went two-point play practices man the defense had no answer I and mean, they give schottenheimer and mccarthy a lot of credit Boy, they had some really good plays. Again, five for five, didn't run the ball one time. Now, I'll tell you what, had kind of some kind of high hopes, you know, for I had some I had some really high hopes for Hunter Lipke. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe things in the preseason with the games will kind of turn out differently. He's been a but little anonymous. I would say you could throw him into that group that we were like, oh, here we are, OTAs, mini camps. Oh, look, he's getting work with the ones. Oh, hey, look, he's doing this. Oh, hey, look, he's doing that. I think he's been just, yeah, like you said, anonymous, I think, is a really good word. And, you know, maybe in these games, the preseason games where it gets down the end and they're trying to kill games and they're just handing him the ball, let's see. But of the, all the running backs, I would say he he's not making me want to – Put Sean McEwen on the street. You know what I'm saying? I think you're going to have McEwen. Have, I think McEwen's had some good practices. By that's the way, what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying you carry the fullback guy, or you carry the fourth tight end. How you going to How you going to play that? That's where I think that that's where the numbers are going to be. By, by the way, at least early on, another difference that we'll see it's the elimination of that uh, that Kellen Moore Hulk package. I have not seen hard. Like I think maybe once. I've seen an offensive lineman go in their lineup as a they fullback. Went full house, yeah, they've done full house, but not as offensive lineman, no. It's 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 not been common at all. All right, uh, last one here. We'll work on a Dean Julia question because this is one that we we had from a couple different people, but but Dean will represent today. Uh, how would you rank the running backs right now behind Pollard? So uh, you know, this, you can rank this however you like. However, you think the depth chart will shake out, Brian, or or who do you think's had the best camp? I think for me, out of the running backs behind Pollard. The guy who's at the very top of the list, and I know we've been fans of him. The Cowboys have been fans of him. Fans seem to like Malik Davis a little bit more, but Rico Dowdle's been the best running back behind Pollard at camp to me. Yeah, Rico Dowdle has done a, a really, really nice job. I, I think there's the the people's champ too. Deuce Vaughn has done a 
a really nice job when given an opportunity. I know yeah. uh, yesterday there were some clips of him with some blitz pickup stuff on Fowler and stuff and kind of stepping up. We'll see when when things get really, really serious, you know, uh, with all that. But I'll say this, though, Pollard, Dowdle, uh, Vaughn, even Ronald Jones. I think Ronald Jones, I know he's got to deal with the suspension for the first two, but I'll tell you what, man, he's they, – they, these guys have all looked good. And I know I mentioned what Hunter Lipke and some of the issues that he might have and disappearing a little bit, but – you know, they, they, this this running back room is making me feel a little bit different about what I feel like they need to do going forward. I think that, you know, there's always that that hint of, you know, who in, depending on who you talk to in the organization, there's always that hint of where's could, uh, could old uh, Ezekiel Elliott come back. But I know the one guy who really wants him is that owner. I think the owner would fight to have Zeke back. Oh I yeah, every, I think I think these running backs are kind of holding Zeke off right now. To be honest with you, so we'll see, we'll see. How it goes. That that does it for us here today on the Love the Star podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, they will be back here. Uh, we've got a, a preseason game coming up here shortly. Then they'll be back in Frisco for practices soon, uh, and so we'll we'll have a lot more coverage for you. But uh, until next time, for Brian Broadus, I'm Bobby Belt. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys later. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.